Okay. Should have went through, but. Okay. Okay, good. Well, folks, welcome back to the second segment of Quantum Leap Live. And um, today we have a special guest who's really a, a thought leader and a thinker and author and a presenter on a number of important topics. We're actually going to um, talk about focus on sleep today, but I did want to mention some of his additional publications. And my name is David Kirsten. I'm a co-host of uh, Quantum Leap, and my co-host Corey Knott is here, and we've actually both helped um, you know, facilitate his courses um, through the INR, and I'll let um, Corey or, or Dr. Bornstein talk more about how you can view his courses. But um, Corey, if you don't mind just telling us um, about you and then how you know Dr. Bornstein. All right, let me get into this. So I am Corey Nod, and uh, for this podcast, I am a coach for business partnerships. I am co-owner of Take Wing Coaching with my wife, uh, Gail. And uh, But in my other life, which I rarely bring up in, in this podcast, I, I do um, IT and software development for a company called Institute for Natural Resources, among other companies. But they are sort of my um, big project and have been for many, many years. And as, as the pandemic hit and things went online, I got to know a lot more of um, the instructors because originally they were out there doing these things live on, in person. And uh, when we brought them all online, uh, a number of us, I brought in David and so on to help support the instructors as I do these webinars. And so INR does webinars mainly for medical professionals because they need to get continuing education. And they have these amazing instructors like Dr. Bornstein um, but one thing I have learned as being a, um, you know, a lay person in this is that a lot of these topics are really, really interesting. I mean, if you are a, a nerd about medicine or, uh, health or anything else, I would encourage you to check out the inrseminars.com to see what they are and maybe, you know, look at, uh, either some of the live webinars or even the bookstore because, you know, like Dr. Bornstein's webinars on, um, on aging and uh, circadian rhythms and so on. There's a lot that you can learn. Some of longevity. it you will not, learn, but there's, and longevity. Yeah, there's so much just like, oh my gosh, there's things that we just need to make changes in our life. And it's so worth um, following this stuff. So glad to have you on here, Dr. Bornstein. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would make um, one, one slight correction and say, really it's healthcare professionals. And when people right. think right. medical professionals, they think doctors. But right. the INR programs are approved for nurses, nutritionists, case managers, OTs, PTs, uh, assisted living, all different types of nursing professionals. So even uh, peripheral medical healthcare people can get credits right. through INR, not just physicians. Yeah, even massage therapists, acupuncturists, uh, I think chiropractors in some cases we, we get. David and I know a lot of those kind of people with alternative health, but they uh, would benefit from a lot of this. Right? Yeah, and I think just uh, since you're new to this show, Doctor, we, we kind of focus on business development issues, but we also like to highlight kind of the different things that make people business leaders or thought leaders. And I think you're just a great example of that and in, in all your background that you have, because in this kind of complicated world, everything kind of works you, we, we got to try to get it working together. You know, you're a teacher, you're a formal chief medical officer of a medical technology company. I mean, you're a current lecturer. You're also a, a current teacher, too, of, of medical stuff. And you're an author, too, which your new book, The Truth About Vaping Nicotine, is a best-selling book on Amazon. So, um, you know, we just love all the content you put out there. And um, you're an incredible researcher and kind of purveyor of this information. But I, I you know, I'm going to open it up to you to just tell us what you what you do and maybe some of your recent publications. And then we are going to focus on the sleep issue today because I wanted to kind of drill down on each of your kind of areas of expertise as as we have you on our podcast. Thank you. Sure. So um, one of the other things that I do is I also teach high school. On the days that I'm not teaching healthcare professionals, I teach biology and health to uh, help high school students. And in today's day and age, 
um, high school students know little of nothing when they get to me at eighth and ninth grade. So over the summer, I wrote a trilogy of children's science books. And uh, the first two of them are now out on Amazon. This one called The Sun's Secret, S-U-N apostrophe S, The Sun's Secret is about photosynthesis for seven to nine-year-olds. And so if a seven to nine-year-old and their parents reads this, they'll have a really good idea that we breathe the oxygen the plants put out and they bring in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And then maybe by the time they get to my class, they'll have some kind of an idea. The second one in the series is called The Earth's Secret. And this is microbiology for seven to nine or 10 year olds. Again, for parents to sit and read an actual science book. This isn't C Spot Run. This talks about bacteria and fungi and how you make yogurt and pickles and what mushrooms are. It really gives the, um, the children an idea of what's going on in our natural world. And that's what I spent my summer doing. And one of the things it does is that I used AI to generate pictures of people like Van Leeuwenhoek, who invented the first microscope, and Pasteur, who's the father of pasteurization, and Lister of aseptic technique. So I go through actual history, and I go through what the microbiology is, so a parent can actually sit with their kids and learn some science. And the reasoning is, and Albert Einstein really said it best, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, then you don't know it well enough by yourself. So with the pictures and the simple copy, I wrote a scientific trilogy for parents so the children will see their parents get it and they get it will ask more questions. The last one, The Sea's Secret, S-E-A apostrophe S, will be publishing in about two weeks and that will be about the ocean and the weather cycle and the carbon cycle. So any group of parents or educational area that wants to pick up the secret series, the sun secret, the earth secret, the sea secret, for first, second, and third graders, it's a tremendously new and different, really educational science trilogy for children. And that's what I spent my summer doing. Nice. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I have a nine-year-old, so <laughs> that, 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 you know, they often see things on the internet or that aren't, aren't accurate or they hear bits and pieces so it's actually um i'd love to <laughs> have her read one of those books you know as her reading so um to to learn something um you know now can you just introduce this sleep epidemic i know you do a a webinar or at least one per inr on the sleep epidemic but what is that and what should folks know about this kind of sleep epidemic Sure. When I was working in, um, in the medical device industry, I started studying and researching the circadian rhythm, which is the 12 hour rhythm during the day and 12 hours at night. It's a 24 hour diurnal rhythm day and night that we all live by. And I was looking to heal wounds better and faster with medical devices, either during the day or during the night at a person's circadian preference when their cells were doing their most healing. So I've been studying circadian medicine and sleep for the better part of a decade and a half at really the highest levels. And I have a patent in circadian medicine, multiple publications. And now I teach five different courses that I wrote in circadian science for INR. One is this sleep detriment, like you said, the sleep issues that everyone has. Another one is called timing is everything which is how doctors and hospitals could better treat patients if they actually preserved and respected their circadian rhythm instead of keeping them up at all hours. I teach another course in chronopharmacology. Is there a better time to actually take medicines day, night, morning, afternoon? And the answer is yes, based on your liver, your kidneys, your heart. They're all functioning differently at different times of the day. So medications have a preference for time called chronopharmacology. I teach another course in adolescent sleep medicine and another one in how medications affect sleep. People don't realize, but blood pressure meds, cardiac meds, certainly caffeine, ephedrine, cold meds, Benadryl, uh, even NSAIDs, simple Advil, they all affect sleep. 
Benzodiazepines approved for sleep, terrible long-term for sleep, terrible. Um, THC, cannabis, awful for long-term good slow-wave sleep habits. So there's a tremendous amount of information that the layman, uh, your everyday person, and most medical professionals just don't understand because it's not things they teach in medical school. You have to focus on it and work on it for a few years to get it down. And I've done that and written five CE approved courses across all healthcare communities that I give for INR now in these subjects. Okay, great. Yeah, and I've helped facilitate a number of those and it's actually made a big difference in my life. Some of the kind of the insights you can use. I know you have that great anecdotal story about how you used to what was it grab like that tallest Starbucks coffee and, you know, drink a lot of caffeine at all hours of the day and, you know, your sleep suffered. And I heard that story and it kind of hit home with me that I've made some changes and started sleeping a lot better. And that transfers into a lot increased strength, you know, my workouts, you know, way more productivity. You just feel entirely different. I, you know, I know there's a number of other things people can do, but I don't know if you'd mind telling us a little bit about that anecdotal story and how people can improve their sleep habits or what they can sure. kind of red flags to, to look sure. at. Sure. When, um, when I was in the medical device uh, world, um, I was traveling back and forth to the UK and to Scotland quite a bit, doing some human clinical trials at the University of Edinburgh. And jumping time zones, one week in the UK, one week home, working all kinds of crazy hours. Um, you drink a lot of coffee. And my heart was getting very jumpy. I wasn't sleeping well. And, you know, my, I, uh, my physicians, I would see a cardiologist, I went to see another doctor. I said, well, Jenny, I think we want to put you on some blood pressure medication. We want to put you on this medication. And being a person who's been working out five days a week for the better part of four decades now, I, um, I said, wait a minute, this just can't be, something's going on here. I'm too healthy for this to be happening. When I started counting my milligrams of caffeine, I was up over 800 milligrams of caffeine a day. It was very much affecting my sleep. And when I started diving into the science of that, this is 2017, 2018, circa that time period, I figured out, you know what, I'm missing my deep sleep. I'm missing my most reparative and restorative sleep at night because of the caffeine, because I'm working out late and I'm eating late. I was doing everything that crazy executives do when you're in the position I was in. So I started practicing time-restricted feeding, no food after five or six o'clock at night, most days, cut my caffeine down under 200 milligrams a day. Uh, that was a miserable three weeks, just ask my wife. And... I also started making sure that I exercised earlier in the day. And all of a sudden, when I started preserving and respecting my circadian rhythm, which is genetically imprinted in all of us, all of my symptoms started going away. My tachycardia went away, my indigestion went away, my GERD went away. I started losing some more weight instead of getting a little bit heavier than I wanted to. And the biggest point for you, David, and for all of us to understand is when we go and we exercise, you're not going to lose fat in your 40 minute treadmill run at 5 p.m. after work. You're just going to be burning stored muscle glycogen. Every one of us loses fat overnight. That's when our circadian rhythm turns. That's when our metabolism starts to burn fat. During the day, we're genetically programmed to burn sugar. At night, we burn fat. So the ways that we can assist in doing that are a couple of things. Number one, you can do some resistance training, put on a little bit of muscle, weights, calisthenics, exercise bands. Muscle has more mitochondria, so it's more active tissue. Number two, go to sleep in a fasted state. If your insulin is low and your glucose is low when you go to sleep, then your pituitary gland puts out more human growth hormone, and your thyroid gland puts up more thyroid hormone, and those drive the fat into your mitochondria, in your muscles, in your brown adipose tissue overnight. So if you want to lose weight and rearrange your body percentages, instead of 40 minutes on the treadmill at 5 p.m., do 25 minutes in the weight room. You don't have to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Just put on some muscle. 25 minutes in the weight room, 
20 minutes on the treadmill, don't eat after six o'clock, and make sure you get to bed before 11, and with good slow wave deep sleep of two to three hours from 11 to three, and then normal dreaming sleep from three to seven, you will start seeing your body change because your circadian rhythm, the beautiful symphony that's our, our metabolism, will kick in and many of your problems will go away. Yeah, well put. And, you know, within the past year or so, I, I feel like your teachings on this sleep have probably made a bigger difference on anything and that they've made a lot of other things possible in my life. For example, some of these workouts and things. So I know sometimes folks have to... Very happy to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Corey if he has any thoughts in, uh, for the second part, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've been definitely thinking a lot more about sleep now, you know, with the five-year-old and um, not just the changes and patterns and networking and all the other things I have to do. It's good to think about these things. Um, <clears throat> so I always get the question of, you know, the why. What really motivates you to do this? What do you feel is your kind of driving purpose behind well, this work and, you know, educating children and the vaping and so on. I mean, it, it's, it's, you have many um, different prongs there, but. Uh... The vaping is because I, I think it's a disaster in America right now. People have no idea. When I say no idea, I mean no idea how much nicotine these kids today are taking in. You'll find some people on the web. You'll find people on LinkedIn. You'll find people in different social medias. I would say to you, oh, you know, vaping is better than cigarettes. Maybe if you're uh, smoking two packs a day and you switch to vaping, maybe it'll be a little bit better for you. What we don't know about vaping, however, is a very thick book. And every page we fill into that book is detrimental. But for the kids, we're talking, the, you know, the 10 to 26 or 28 year old crowd. Um, these are kids who would never pick up cigarettes in the first place, ever. They just wouldn't do it. But now they're trying vaping. And they're getting more nicotine in a two- to three-minute vape session than they would by smoking five or six cigarettes. Highly addictive. Changes their personality. And, and these kids whose brains, so the prefrontal cortex, the logic and reasoning center, that takes eight to ten years to form from 14 to 24, that's now forming in the mix of highly addictive nicotine and chemicals. So we're turning kids' circuit boards that they're going to have for the rest of their lives, their logic and reasoning center, into addictive personalities. It's not only the nicotine. These kids are putting THC in the vapes. They're putting hallucinogens in the vapes. I personally, from students of mine, have knowledge of three different young people who are not with us anymore because they found fentanyl laced vapes from a street vape that they bought and they died. So there's never been a more dangerous time for a kid to start picking up some of the stuff. And I know kids in the high schools that I teach in that can't go 10 minutes without vaping. They can't go to sleep without a vape under their pillow. So I, I've made it a bit of a mission that if I have the ability to speak clearly about these issues and get out to an audience to try and get out to the largest audience I can one of the things that I say when I'm speaking in the webinars is I say, if you are within the sound of my voice, you are the resistance. Take some of the knowledge I'm giving you and bring it back to your communities and your kids and your schools. And let these kids know that if they get started and they get addicted, which they will very quickly to nicotine or THC or some other vapes, they're going to be giving away their free will to whoever's selling them the vape. And why would they want to do that? Yeah, I'll put the link to that Ripple Effect podcast where we go into detail on the vaping, and I know we're going to keep an eye on that issue. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so what about, um, <clears throat> I mean, these other things. So I, I get the vaping. What else it just kind of drives you behind the sleep and everything else? I mean, I, So I get... the, um, the, the sleep was driven by my own personal journey. That, that was a question that David asked me. And when I, when I tend to dive into a subject, I dive into it hands, <laughs> hands and feet. And when I saw the, the, the real lack of education about basic circadian rhythm, about people don't understand. I mean, let me ask you, gentlemen, let me see if you know the answer to this question. If you go to sleep at 200 pounds at night and you wake up at 198 pounds and you burn two pounds of fat overnight, where does that fat go? 
<laughs> that goes into the air. Hmm. How? Uh, through you're kind of like breathing it out. I forget how. <laughs> of course, I heard this from you before. You heard this from me, right? So you breathe your fat out through your nose. Unbelievable, but that's what you do because there's a conservation of mass and a conservation of energy. And the fat is a long chain hydrocarbon. We mix that with oxygen in our mitochondria. We breathe that out as carbon dioxide. So letting people know that you actually breathe your fat out through your nose overnight is carbon dioxide. And depending on if you want to lose fat, it's not just calories in, calories out. It's actually sleep. It's right. sleep and muscle. And that's how you will lose weight. And getting some of these concepts, I have trained nutritionists, I have trained nurses, trained um, you know, uh, longevity people in my lectures who when I mention this to them, they say, what do you mean you breathe fat out through your nose? What are you, crazy? And when I explain it to them and I show them the biochemical pathways and that if you live within your circadian rhythm and you understand all of the puzzle pieces of where these pathways go, then you can run your life to make them run efficiently. And, and that's sort of what drives me. As a molecular biochemist, my first degree, um, I tend to see a lot of this much more clearly than other folks do. Right. So in the interest of time and so on, is, you know, in given our audience, uh, who would you like to connect with? Media, print publications, other experts? Where can we help you be more? Um, I, would, I would love to speak with some experts. I see all kinds of gurus on, um, online. And some of them speak about the most crazy uh, ideas. You know, you'll time restricted feeding, for example, eating within a 10 hour window, very important to go to sleep fasting. But you find some of these gurus who will say, well, gee, uh, I'm going to restrict myself 20 hours. So I'm not going to eat until one in the afternoon. And that's what I think everybody should do. Metabolically, ridiculous. You burn most of your calories in the morning. You have your highest insulin rate, highest insulin sensitivity in the morning. If you're going to practice time-restricted feeding, the best time to eat is from 8 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. They've done studies where they've taken patients and they have done everything the same. Same exercise, same sleep, same diet, same everything. The only thing they changed is the time of feeding. They gave them their calories in the morning and early afternoon or the same calories late afternoon and night. Every single one, late afternoon and night, metabolic disease and obesity. Every one they gave in the morning, they lost weight and they had a much better metabolic profile. So to get this message out and let people know that, yeah, there is a lot of junk science out there. To whoever I could speak to about that, I, I would love to with, with credibility and logic and reason. As someone who's not selling anything, I mean, I'm selling my knowledge, I'm lecturing, but I'm not trying to put off a supplement or put on whatever. I'm just giving you the basic metabolic facts and uh, knowledge is power. Yeah. And uh, I, I know we're just at time here, so we're going to wrap up, but um, I was, you know, if there's a medical conference or I thought other either like magazines and newspapers, you know, should, you know, write almost op-eds on some of these issues that you talk about, particularly the, the nicotine and the vaping, you know, the public health hazard um, part of it. I so, have published a few um, a few articles on the dangers of seed oils, on the benefits of, of correct and deep sleep, and on the dangers of vaping. You can find some of these new publications of mine on my LinkedIn site under LinkedIn articles, and those you can read for free and then decide if you want to take one of my courses or look at something else. So I do have some publications available for folks to read on LinkedIn if they want to go to articles. Yeah, yeah, I'll put the, the link to your LinkedIn, also the link to um, find, you know, INR webinars that you coming up, that you have coming up. You actually have those on your LinkedIn, so I might just go with the LinkedIn, but also link to your Ripple Effect podcast from about a month ago where we go into the vaping and uh, we'll keep in touch as you, um, we'll talk about maybe a next uh, s set of topics, or if you put out another book, we'd love to talk about um, any new publications. You can find all of my, uh, all of my books are available on Amazon, or you can find descriptions of them at Dr. Eric Hornstein, one word, dot com, and that'll link you right to Amazon for anyone that's interested. Okay.
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Well, we're, I'm going to wrap up here. We are at time. So thanks for coming on doctor and we'll, we'll see you soon.